if you can hear me? So we've just been hearing about some of the applications of crystal theory in high energy physics. It's certainly an area that is starting to come into its own. Crystal theory for many years uh, was not something which was paid much attention to by the physics community, although there were many areas of mathematics that seemed to be influenced by it. Uh, differential geometry and representation theory in particular. Um, now, I've been concerned primarily with how general relativity fits into the Twister program. This again is part of the high energy physics program, if you like, because they look at um, gravity on scattering and so on. Um, this is all a perturbative attitude to uh, physics. I'm more concerned with trying to do something which is not non conservative and which extends some of the more impressive uh, features of twisted theory. I think uh, it's still a big audience, so I know I, I shall have, I have to be somewhat uh, descriptive in what I say. Uh, I should also repeat what I said last time, just so that in case anybody was not here, I guess to remind people the kind of thing that Twisted Theory is about. The basic Twisted Picture, we have a light ray, new focus. I'm sorry, does this work? We need to do the focus a bit better. I hope that the screen can be seen. What's the word? This was the slide that started with last time, so I didn't say too much about it. But the light rays are points in this space, and the points in this space are Riemann spheres in this space. The idea is to try and make this space, the twisted space, to be a complex manifold of some sort. And uh, one starts by introducing coordinates, and then you have to have this emission relation here, which is part of the definition of PN. You restrict that emission relation to uh, to, uh, um, to insist on that emission relation and you have an extended region here the two uh, uh, halves of objective complex objective free space, which is divided into by the real hypersurface. And uh, the real sphere over here is supposed to be a uh, little straight line, an analytic, uh, complex analytic straight line in the complex projected free space. Um, and we've been seen on this before. Uh, after the one talks instead about the non-projected free space, now to break away that is what one finds is easy to talk about. So you have points in the this is now the C4, the complex vector space four dimensions, and with the crystal proportionality, this point in the space here. Uh, and physically, we want to interpret these things in terms of the momentum and the angular momentum of a massive part. So that's sort of basic geometry and physics. A lot of what one does in this subject, unfortunately, I think for many people, we are familiar with this notation. Anyway, I I will go to the notation particularly because it would take me too long to go through it. Because you have a translation between the vector tensor notation by a small letters. And capital will be twisted, and roughly speaking, the vector index corresponds to the X product of a spinner index with a complex conjugate spinner index, and the notation automatically accounts for all that. And then you have the basic representation of these position matrices, and the metric itself becomes a product of this sort of skew symmetrical uh, ball. To Two forms, you know, in the uh, <coughs> spin space. And uh, 
you make a reservation on an individual spinner, which as you can see on the picture of his last time, which shows that we were clearly. This would be important for some of the things that we were saying, which is our interpretation of a single index spinner and a two spinner. Uh, after proportionality, it's just a direction on the light cone, in other words, a point on the ring of sphere representing the, this point in the twisted space, and the expansion uh, vector, which corresponds to a flag plane. This is a two dimensional plane which is tangent to the cone here, and you have three that are rotating it, which corresponds to the rotation of this tangent vector here, and the spinner goes to minus itself to go once around. Back to pass itself again when you go to the price So, apart from the ambiguity of sign, this is a very direct and ambiguous representation of a two component system. Okay, that's all very much background, which I said last time. Uh, what else do I want to say in connection with that? Uh, let's put this over here. I think I will be forcing this one last time too. So, Twister. Before I just use the extended coordinates, but they divide uniquely up into two, two spinners, the pi and the omega. In the, I should mention that those people who follow the high energy physics uh, literature will really find Lambda and Mu here, and the indices and conventions are all upside down as far as I'm concerned. It started because they got their conventions from my original paper on twisted theory when I used Lambda and Mu. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that I had all my conventions wrong as far as I'm concerned. That's to say, I looked at the bound set index upwards and the upstairs one downwards, and uh, people aren't going to worry about that. But when you do conformal transformations, it's very important that this thing is a co vector or co twister, co spinner, or so index is downstairs, and this one index is upstairs, and this is related to momentum. Momentum is a co vector, and so when Multiply this by its complement conjugate, and you multiply its complement conjugate, you get a code. So this lower index is code and that really corresponds to the lower index here. And then the upper index is code because of the dual thing that dual complement conjugate, complement conjugate which is the prime here, and dual which is down upstairs. And this is all that's very much reflected in what happens when you take complex conduit of this, but complex conduit of this reverses the two as well as taking complex conduit. So the pi becomes the first, first location, and the other way the second location, and this then becomes the dual of it. This z z bar is this times this plus this times this, and that was the form I wrote last time at the bottom of the uh, page. Anyway, the notation case takes care of a lot of things. When you move the origin, the pi's remain fixed there. Uh, three vectors, three vectors, or three spins, if you like, the independent of the choice of origin, which the only thing change with this explicit uh, formula here. And this is all consistent with the interpretation of the momentum of the massless particle being pi times pi bar, the uh, angular momentum being this formula here, so that Complicated, but basically it involves the symmetrized product of the omega and pi, and that gives you the cellular and then cellular parts of the angular momentum six vector. So this is the physical interpretation of twisters directly in flat space. Now, last time I also mentioned the uh, basic master's equations that one has. Um, I've got two slides of this, I'm not sure which is the right one. Take this one, I think. Here we are. You have these equations, which are the master's equations. Uh, if they're prime indices, that's the right handed uh, part of the particle. If the particle is spin, it's a master's particle, and this is the wave function of that master's particle. It has um, a, a right handed and a left handed part. The right handed part is described by this symmetric 2s index. S is the velocity, so it's 2s 
is the number of indices here, that's an integer, s can be half integer, and this symmetric object <coughs> describes the velocity uh, s particle, which is right-handed, and if you don't have indices, it's the left-handed part. The equation is just the same, except that the indices are the other way around. You have the wave equation is to zero. And then the twister wave function is a holomorphic function of homogeneity degree as given in this thing here. It's minus 2s minus 2. So that you find for uh, masses particles in one, say photon, so you put plus one and minus one is the two values of s. And the, the twister description you have either minus 4 homogeneity or 0 homogeneity for the twister function. And for a linearized graviton, you would have spin 2, uh, or velocity 2, or velocity minus 2, velocity 2 gives you minus 6, and minus 2 gives you plus 2, which is very lopsided. It has, it's not the lopsidedness, it's not important if you're, if you're working simply uh, without worrying about interactions. Uh, it is important when you're worrying about interactions. And I'll say a bit more about that. You can take the dual description and of course the other way around. So saying that now the complex conjugate so the numbers are, are reversed. And the way that one represents the wave function of the twister, these are the wave functions here, in terms of the homomorphic function, is given by these common integrals, which I did show you before. If there are if it's for s equals zero, then you just do a contrainful with a this is epsilon again, so it's a one form that I've got here, you integrate that one form around the loop, and it's easy, this you can see in the projective space, so you have a total projective twisted space, with the point here, that's a point in complexified space time, it's complexified space time, but we will uh, often be interested for a wave function that that should be in a form of form of two. That's where the position vector has an imaginary path which points into the past, uh, that is the past in the interior of the past life curve. And if, you, if your wave function extends into that region, which is called four q, then it's automatically a positive frequency. And wave functions for free particles should be positive frequency. And what this means in twisted space is that this line, which are in the forward tube, this line lies in the top half. So that corresponds completely to the point being ahead of the picture there somewhere in the line. I'm not sure I can see it, but it's there. It corresponds to the uh, imaginary part of the complex vector x being pointing into the past. So that's the forward tube. And if your wave function is extends homomorphically into that region, that's where the x now is in the top half of the space, that will be a positive frequency wave function, as it should be propagates into the future. Um, now twist theory nicely accommodates that if you say, well, we're looking at the top half of the twist space. I should say this is a confusion which uh, may worry people, but I said the top half of the twist space corresponded to right-handed spinning and the bottom half and left-handed spinning, and I'm saying something completely different, that the top half corresponds to positive frequency and the bottom half to negative frequency. That association is entirely coming about because I'm looking at the twisted description and not the dual twisted description. So you stop worrying about that, that's what I'm trying to say. It looks like a lopsidedness. It is a lopsidedness, but that comes about from the fact that I'm looking at the twisted description and not the dual twisted description. Okay, now the top half corresponds in this picture to positive frequency. The bottom half would be negative frequency. Now, the singularities of the twisted function, um, that you have to have singularities in the top half, because otherwise you wouldn't have any answer to your number integral. But the, this example here is very good to show you what happens. You've got two planes which are singular, and which give you two points of intersection with this line, and they're not the for each value of x, you have a Riemann sphere, and then you integrate around that Riemann sphere, and that gives you the value of field. If you have indices on it, you put a lot of pi's in for the right-handed, or a lot of d by d longers for the left-handed. There's a point I want to make here, which is interesting. I haven't said really anything, I 
different stuff, the same positive frequency, anything which is specifically quantum mechanical. But nevertheless, one sees the relationship between the complex conjugation and going over to the derivatives. So it's, it's the twister commutation rule, which uh, comes about from one's attempt to make the twister theory into a quantum theory, so a single quantized uh, theory, first quantum, first quantum, first quantized theory, if you like. And that means that the pi bars, so what's the complex value that we create here? We put by the pi bars in here, so that's no good because the polar are more morphic. You want the complex value to be integral here. So you put the pi bars in place and by e by the omegas, and then you have the answer. It's curious to me. I have this problem in here, and it was really Ben Houston who noticed that you could use these equations here, and then I realized afterwards that that's just this twist quantization procedure. But it's in a purely classical context. Um, but I, I think it's important to point it out that you see this relationship between pi bar and d by the omega, which is the twisted commutation, commutation rule, really, uh, already appearing at this level. Okay, now, as I said before, these quantum integrals, I mean, this is very special, but particularly in some places, and they were spoiled, or well, that's embarrassed in one picture. Because suppose you rotated, then these planes would go somewhere else, and you couldn't add one where the planes in one place or where the planes in another place. Well, maybe you could do that. If you start steering by adding loads and loads of them, you can pick which is here, and then you rotate them, and they don't add up very well. So it's a nice feature of it, but this is really doing first cohomology, and we are now looking at a particular case where. Um, you have covering of your top half of crystal space, which has one region leaves out that camel hunt, and the other region leaves out that camel hunt. The crystal function is on the intersection of those regions, which is where the camel hunt hunts are not, and the region that you're interested in the entire, the whole part of DT plus, is the union of those two regions. And this is, if you have more and more added together lots and lots of these things, it would make a great mess. But the understanding of that mess Homology, you, you could uh, add lots of them together as long as you keep taking um, common refinements of your coverings, and then you'll get more and more sets here. But the important point is to extract the notion which this is trying to tell you. And if you have many, many sets, you can uh, say your twisted function is really a collection of functions indexed in terms of the intersection that is used. You can be used here on open sets on the top half of twist space, and twist the function is really a collection of twist functions, each one defined on the overlaps between two of the U's, and uh, these can be assigned to call it FIJ, and it has to be anti-symmetric because you're really doing a bit of a model interval which goes in one direction, and then if you replace it the other way around, you can change these two in the other direction. And symmetry, and you need this triple rule here uh, because that means that if you move this point around within the triple intersection, it should change the answer, and that is the case of this um, cycle. The cycle rule holds, and uh, this then forms a check per cycle, and uh, you find that there are certain things that will give you zero if the FIJs are uh, sums of functions that you find in one set or the other. If your FIJ here was a sum of the function on here and the function on there, or the difference, these two edges, then it would give you zero. And so you factor out all these things. So you take the F's modular, modular distance here, and that's your representative of cohomology. And you end up uh, with an element of first cohomology, this being the the homogeneity degree of the function you're talking about is minus 2s minus 2, where s is the helicity of the field you're talking about. So that's one of the things I was saying yesterday, but I just thought I'd say it a little bit more completely here. And the early motivation, one of the very strong motivations I had originally for twisted theory was the analog of what you have with the Riemann sphere. And then on the field theory, we want to split your uh, 
functions into positive and negative frequency parts, and leads us to a famous rather than doing a Fourier analysis, which is initially what this is we think in terms of, but you can do it more elegantly in mathematical, geometrical terms by thinking your functions to find them. Equator here, and positive frequency and negative frequency parts. So you extend it into homomorphically into the top half, part of it goes homomorphically in the top half, the other part homomorphically in the bottom half, and this is the splitting of the thing into positive and negative frequencies. I think the convention is usually this is negative frequency, that's positive, but don't mind about it. We have something very analogous in our interest theory, and it took a long time, although this was a big motivation early on, to find an analog of this for the full four dimensional space time, and that's what this theory does for you. How it did this was mysterious until we realized we were doing cohomology. So you say, yes, it's the same thing, but now your cohomology I've extended first, it's first cohomology, I've extended to the top, the bottom, and you split your function into those two parts. <coughs> and it is the same thing as we did before. Here it was just functions, and here it's first cohomology. So as I say, this finally realized one of the very early motivations behind the twist field. Okay, now this is all linear masses fields. Um, we're not doing any interactions, uh, it's just three fields. And it's very neat, and uh, it encompasses so many different things one wants for the wave function, and it also gets rid of all the field equations, that's all homomorphicity, and it always seems to me that's really very attractive. <coughs> now, it does more. What I want to tell you here is what it does more. And I have pictured here two constructions. I want to say, what I'll talk about mainly is the gravity one, which is the second construction here. But I came up with this, um, and I guess it's 1976, I've this slide here. And I think it was the next year when Richard Ward saw how to do it for gauge fields. So it was the same general ideas here, but he showed that you can have an instruction similar to what I was doing in the gravitational case, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. Here I'm just showing you a picture. The picture is basically, okay, you've got a first cohomology element which is painted onto the, onto the space, onto the overlap between different patches, and then you let the paint dry, and it actually slides the patches, crinkles the patches up there, by sliding one across over another, in a way which is defined by the element, the complex function which is on the intersection. I'll say more about that in a minute, that you actually do now create a deformed space by letting this originally passive function painted on the space it become something active which deforms the space. And what Richard Ward did was to see how to treat the gauge fields this way. So first of all, he did for, for the gauge field of electromagnetism and then very quickly, he was only in his second year of his research, graduate student, and so it's really impressive, that he saw how to <coughs> do this for general Groups, so this can be gauge groups which are, are very broad in, 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 in what you're interested in here. Um, so I started with U1, and then you can do SU2 or SU3, or whatever you want, whatever you want. Not a the media, normally, not really a gauge group. And then you are looking at patches here, uh, which are <coughs> have values in the, um, in the Indian group. Or, uh, Anyway, constructed a bundle. And this bundle uh, now contains, I won't go into the details of it, but it does give you, when you translate back, you see that it gives you solutions of the Yang Mills equations very generally, except that they're all self dual. So when I say self dual for Yang Mills, well, you're going to see what it means for electromagnetic theory. You see the photons. Just a second. I'm sorry. In, that, in those pictures, Yes. If you have three little things, if you have four little things, three or four little things, uh, in the current medical, 1976. I mean, the number of sets is just trust the number. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if you have four, it's, is there a reason for these four? It's just sets. Oh, no, that's just... Uh, it's not just the... 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 It's not just the...
Yeah. 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 No, it would be in the fun of the My question is whether uh, you only go to triple intersections, you don't go to. Oh, you mean to the triple intersections? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, no, it, it's only representative. Um, you, you do what I said down to yeah. before. Yeah. Yeah. The picture. I agree, you have to take a certain amount of salt. <laughs> but the uh, algebraic, we have things to find on the intersections. You might have redundancy if you've got four of them. But, the, 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 the indices take care of what you should be doing. Perfect. Yeah, right. So that, I've only used four sets here for descriptive purposes. It doesn't mean to know. So there are four hundred and fifty things. No, you you're right, there are only three. Sorry, I didn't understand. But that's a little yeah. Um, so then we construct the puzzle this way, and although I want to tell you that works, it's, it's, uh, it's very natural. You, you get the Daniels connection, and that gives you a connection which is anti self dual, the conventions I'm using here, which means that the curvature, which would be um, one of these things here, would be two indices. Spinners and then other indices for the gauge field, but the point is it's, it's this one and not this one. In other words, you're looking at an anti self dual gauge field. And that had quite a big influence in pure mathematics because it relates to all sorts of integral systems and a whole lot of work was done uh, on integral systems. There are papers written by all sorts of just very distinguished people huh? on, on this kind of work. Uh, and it's a big subject, um, uh, and there's a book by Mason and Woodhouse which uh, discusses all these things. And I think uh, I'm not going to talk about it here, but the reason I'm going to talk about it is primarily apart from managing the life of the part of these things is that that's all within the anti self dual picture, where things are in a certain sense more integral than they are, in a certain sense they are integral. Uh, and that applies both to gravity and to electromagnetism or the Daniels fields. So you have something which works in the anti self dual case, or self dual if you simply reverse the formalism, but that doesn't, that's not very important because you need to do both parts at once. Let me show you the gravitational case, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. I should put this over here because I can see that it's. Now, the gravitational case, which was the first one, and this is the one I understand the best. Uh, going back to this picture here at the bottom, you want a way, first of all, of converting your function, which in this case will be anti self field because we're looking at functions which are homogeneous to be true. And that function will give you a vector field, and that vector field will tell you how to infinitesimate these as we find this pattern. And then you have a triple overlap, you see. It's easiest if you just talk about two patches, actually, so it's even more simple than you're asking about. Uh, so let me do it a little bit more explicitly. Yeah, I'll do it here. Um, okay, let's imagine that we have a piece of complex projective free space which is a tubular neighborhood of a complex projective line. It, could, it need be for the most general construction, but this is the sort of uh, piece, the smallest piece that you work with. So we take a little tubular neighborhood. This is TP3 over here. There is a line in TP3, and this is flatten that out. We get you to the neighborhood of that line. Now, this is a, so going this way, we have a two sphere, top one of things. That two sphere, I can imagine, is broken into two hemispheres with an overlap. And that's, in this picture, what's going on. So this is one hemisphere over here, that's the other hemisphere, and this is the overlap between the two. On that overlap region, I shift the piece of projected free space. So it looks like this picture here. 
if it's in the nest, I'm not worried too much. I'm not worried about the edges here. But what I am worried about is the fact that this complex objective line doesn't hit any point. It's not a whole lot of curve. Now you have to repeat the theorems to see whether you can do this. And there is a theorem due to Kodara, which tells us that provided this definition is small enough within some deep open region, then you can find a new homologue curve which threads through here. Not as it is broken from here, but the actual initial homologue curve. So CP1, this is the power of the again, and you use the Kodara theorem to say that you can have that, and that the Kodara sensor arguments to say that not only can you do it, but there will be a four parameter family of these, as long as the definition is within some local region, there will be four parameter family of these homomorphic curves. They have to be ones which belong to the same homology class as the one we started with. You could have started here with a just a cubic or something. So it's got to be starting with a homology class of a line, and then so you just imagine this is a continuous definition, then this line will be right on the homology class, and you then look for and homomorphic curves, which are human spheres, and right on the homology class, and the four parameter pattern. So this is a four parameter family, you can make space whose points are these curves. And that space would be a four-dimensional complex manifold. So you can call it a four-dimensional complex manifold. Now I'm going back to things which I said earlier talked about quickly in my previous talk, that you have to recognize the conformal structure of the Minkowski space and its flat Lorentzian four space, if you complexify to this picture, then you have when do two points in this Minkowski space, when are they null separate? When is there a null line through the two of them, null separated? That corresponds to these projected lines that seem to be intersected. So then an intersection is quite an intersection corresponds to the line that is real Minkowski space to begin with. Um, and these things uh, represent my points. So you by simply knowing CP3 and knowing the lines in CP3 and knowing what they mean, you can reconstruct the uh, complexified Minkowski space, which really is the Klein representation, which I was telling you before. So I'm not saying And the points now corresponds to alpha lines. So you have alpha planes over here. Actually, because of the points here, these planes correspond to large. So that is the sort of common picture, which is the uh, client representation. But when we deform, you still have a notion of these things meeting. And so, therefore, you still have a notion of null separation in this green space here. And we find, in fact, this is a general anti symmetric, so general anti self dual complex space time. Anti self dual, that means the vial tensor. <coughs> is anti-self-dual. The vial curvature tensor, conformal curvature tensor, has this anti-self-dual character. And that, you can go, you can see it's a general construction, but you can go backwards. Because when you have a vial curvature which is anti-self-dual, then you do have, in the general case, alpha planes. Alpha planes are anti-self-dual null planes. Or the self-dual is confused now. Anyway, one or the other. And they are the points that you get here. And then you have the other way around, which is these planes. Now, in this construction, you retain the alpha planes, but you lose the beta planes. So you have the formal curvature in general, which shows itself in the absence of beta planes. But the formal curvature is necessarily anti self dual. I guess, yes, these are self dual planes, isn't it? The conformal curvature is anti self dual, so that moves the beta planes. The beta planes being the anti self ones. But the alpha planes are still there. Um, it's a completely general construction, local basis. So you can take any anti self dual space 
So here, instead of the clan quadric, uh, and then you have the alpha planes in it, the alpha planes give you the twisted space, so you go that way, you go in the other direction, you've got the deformed twisted space, which is this thing here, then you can reconstruct the anticircular space time. So we've got the deformed space time. Now, this is another metric in this sense. If you want the metric, what well, the way I was doing it originally is you have a vibration here. There's a projection down from the twisted space down to CP1. And you can see that in the omega pi notation that I have, the problem is you've got the pi spins and they're, they're globally defined. The others are more complicated, but you have the pi spins that are globally defined. Um, now, I, you can actually slightly generalize this. Before, yeah. Let me have this picture in a different form here. This is just what I was doing before, except I'm doing it infinitesimally. Infinitesimally, it should be the spin 2 case, which I showed here. That's the spin 2 case, or minus 2, I think it is. This is the minus 2, which is the case of bottom down here. In that case, uh, is where you have a twisted function which has homogeneity plus two. And now what you do is for the infinitesimal definition, you take d by dz of f, dz is the twisted coordinates, and then you take the infinity twister, plug that in, and this gives you a, a, a vector field. And that vector field gives you the actual definition here. And then if you could exponentiate that, then you would get the, the finite deformation, which I was having before. But infinitesimally, it ties in exactly with what we had in the previous complementary construction, and it's exactly what you get here with the f thing in that other picture being this homogeneity 2 function that you have in this table. Okay, so that's the nonlinear graviton construction. You have to go through it and see, okay, it does give you. Get a connection, that connection is zero torsion, and so on and so forth. It really works. I should say that there was a generalization of this that Richard Ward did, and that's an initial idea that he made the theory. Uh, well, yes, it does. You see, another way of. I agree with this with the infinity twister. Now, that infinity twister is degenerate in the case of zero cosmological constants, is what I'm doing here. And that gives you the projection, which I was talking about here. But if you take the cosmological constant that is non-zero, and just to remind you of all this stuff, I was telling you previously that we had, in the flat case, we find picture, if you want to give a metric to the space here, introduce the infinity twister, or a metric twister, you might call it, which is a symmetrical object. My microphone, oh, come back again. <laughs> it's a symmetrical object, which is an infinity twister, which gives you the metric, and it also reduces the conformal group down to the Poincare group. And this is this thing I alpha beta, which for zero homological constant, which is what you want when you're talking about, uh, well, the Koski space. Of course, it's zero cosmological constant, then you, you have a degenerate infinity twist. And that is what gives you the projections here. But in general, if you have um, a non degenerate infinity twister, then you have uh, this infinity twister, which is, is um, you can't see all these pictures at once. <laughs> The, uh, for the super space is positive, this factor, and in the system space is negative. And that corresponds to this infinity being uh, a non singular rather than a curve. Uh, I just want to say all that because uh, Richard Ward then carried this out in the case of a um, non degenerate IR for The construction is exactly the same, except we have now this projection. You have a, a two form in space here, which is not degenerate. 
Let me get into detail here as well. We report to the development that I just want to mention that yes, the construction does work also in the case of now I realise I've got to say. What I should have said is that this construction not only gives you a metric in the case of the degenerate uh, beta, but that metric automatically satisfies the Einstein equations. So if you have a Ricci flat, the Ricci tensor vanishes. Now if we introduce the more general construction, the Ricci borderline, where this I is now non-degenerate, the whole thing goes through just as before, except that now you have solved the Einstein equations again, but this is now an Einstein space in the mathematician sense, that is to say you have the metric and the Ricci tensor are proportional. And in fact, proportionality is this lambda, the cosmological constant. So I just put that in to show that it's a bit more general than I was saying before. But it's just, it works just as well. You don't have this pretty clean projection, but it works just as well. You have a way of getting, at least locally, all the um, left hand is what anti self dual, that's to say, the bio culture. The self dual part of it vanishes, but then it's all solutions of the Einstein equations, with or without the cosmological constant, that vacuum all those values and structures. Now, get is rather that's a word which is a little bit too strong here. They're all implicitly there, but if you want to write them down, it's not so easy. You can write down these definitions, that's easy. You can just take it to the space and Slide it along, you it down, you go into the space. But what is the space time? You want to find that space time, you've got to find where it's all curved up. And that is non trivial. You can do it in often many special cases, but the general problem of finding those lines is a non trivial problem. It contains the solution in principle, but it need not be a very practical way of finding the solution. Now, the big problem here, of course, is the fact that we are stuck in anti self solutions. And this is what I call the Google problem. You might say, what's Google? <laughs> this is a terminology that is probably only familiar to people who um, belong to the former British Empire, because it has to do with cricket. And it's the name of a ball which is bowled by the bowler. See, people say, oh, well, that's essentially a screwball in, uh, in baseball. No, it's not. You see, cricket has the characteristic feature that the ball bounces, and therefore it's sensitive to whether the ball is spinning right handed or left handed about this direction of motion. And physical part of the mass is part of the that photon, its spin is about its direction of motion, either right handed or left handed, or the two elicities. Now, baseball doesn't do anything for it. But in cricket, the system ball bounces, it does. And so a googly is a ball which is bowled in a very clever way. You see, normally there's a thing called a leg break, which spins left handed. And there's some bowlers who do this very well. But the real skill is if you can look as though you're doing that, but very subtly, you hold your hand in a very clever way, I don't know how they do it, and the ball spins the other way. So it gives you a right handed spin within the general framework of left handed. And that's a rule. It's also very difficult to do, and that also is a problem here. This is pretty difficult to do. But it has been, in my view, the major stumbling block in twisted theory for, I don't know, 40 years, 50, I can't even remember now, a long time. And uh, when I say major stumbling block, it's not just for general relativity. You see, the young Mills also start to this. You simply have the left hand solutions in this instruction, you don't have the right hand. So this is the thing, uh, as I said, you want to have a way of using the, the same framework as we had for the left-handed ones, but which gives you the right-handed ones as well. Also. So a solution to the Google problem has to be the, the major stumbling block in the development of twist theory. So what are the relation twisters? Well, this is a pr proposal, and it's still only a proposal because I don't really know whether it works or not, to generalize the framework we had before to the and, uh, and the dexterous or whatever you say. And if you like the same arm, then you have to just spin both ways. 
Now, a suggestion, a suggestion that is, I should send the name of my study now, is uh, the discussion I had with my Katia, who I was suggesting some ideas, I didn't see how this would work, and he said, oh, well, you should not come today. And that's just really the gist of the argument, and this happened to be in the house at the time. That's why it's called. I think I can call it palatial for a different reason now, because the, the, we have all these places in the ancient civilizations here in Mexico, and people start just climbing up on the way there, and we're making some new advanced power in this subject. So we can say that the house refers to that now. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's palatial to us theory. In order to describe general or renting, Globally and alcoholic, so that just means that we don't behave to that globally. Space times, in twisted terms, we appear to be driven to non commutative twisted junctures. Even for classical space time. See, this is a very complex idea. Actually, the idea would be to try and drive the thing in the direction of quantum gravity or something. But the things I'm going to say today, except so just at the end of my time, will be entirely classical. Space time geometry, but doing it in a quantum way. So it's kind of a quantum, quantum approach to classical space time geometry. And the, I will have a space picture, something like the one that was shown you before, um, with a twisted space, crucially a long projected one, projected twisted space, which is a little track of the scale factors, but that's just a picture I have here in some sense. But where does another come from non positive picture? And uh, this is work in progress very much. I just want to give you a hint. I'm not going to use the time. Oh, I've got the negative time problem. Well, I mean, it's just as well I don't have too much time because I don't want to get a normal talk. And it does seem to me that this is where we have to go. And there are a lot of things in. in, in Talks we had with Ernesto just recently, which made it look very intriguing that the geometrical structures that come out naturally in twisted theory and those which come out in non constant geometry <laughs> are so much related to each other that it's really very, very tempting. But uh, let me try and uh, say it a little bit more completely what we're going to do here. Just to remind you, we have the Seemingly harmless looking conversation rules which come in now again when we're trying to do things which you may have a little bit to do with quantum mechanics, they're pretty classical things nevertheless. And you know that the commuting, the Zs commute for themselves, the Z bars commute for themselves, but Z Z bar is a canonical commutation rule. And if you remember this thinking about this was very crucial to leading one to the whole model. Uh, functions as your wave functions because to say uh, you want a wave function in ordinary standard physics, you say you want momentum and position, you choose one or the other, have a momentum description or a position description, these canonical conjugates, and one becomes the derivative with respect to the other. Now, uh, you have to choose what you're doing, you can't choose what you're doing, maybe it's the twisted description, and then the z bars become derivatives with respect to the z. And so it's, uh, but that was drives you to thinking to, in terms of homomorphic functions, which are wave functions. And so that, that's part of that already. Okay, so what we're going to do is take, take these rules and somehow think of them as done in a patch. So we have something like a uh, construction we had before, which was before we glued together, that's just two, two patches, not lots of patches, but just two patches, and you glue them together, and you want to glue them. You see, I, I, the thing I was asking my idea was something which didn't seem to work, but I didn't know what to do. Namely, you want to have no space down here. Somehow you've got the sheaf of holomorphic functions sitting up here, and you try to patch something together when there isn't the space down here. And I couldn't see how you do that. But then you say, well, what about the non commutative geometry? You say, wow, yes, that seems to be good. Yes. And I always steer away from this seems to be something that I don't even understand. Never try very hard to understand it. The real I do have to try much harder to understand it. So you basically have now the algebra 
of the you don't have the chief of the functions over a given space, you have the algebra of the z up here. So you've got so Heisenberg type algebra, we did just not much z, but he got z. Let me not mention the point here, you see. One of the driving forces, of course, behind twisted theory is homomorphicity. You want the power of complex analysis to be what carries you forward. Now, as soon as you introduce complex conjugates, well, you're in trouble. And any sort of natural thing, obvious geometrical thing you do in curved spaces and so on, immediately brings in complex conjugates. So the philosophy here is, okay, once you see a complex conjugate, you quantize. And that's the basic rule here. So it's okay, not, I'm not going to do something non homomorphic that would be travesty, that would be the heresy. <laughs> heresy in this view. The dogma is you can keep homomorphic. So you say, okay, you can keep homomorphic if you make partial derivatives with respect to the variables instead. So if you look at the algebra over here, you know, now you see, in quantum mechanics, it's the sort of thing physicists do, when you've got this algebra of operators, you look for a complete set of commuting operators. And then the, uh, the rest of the algebra comes from derivatives with respect to those. And that's a very standard quantum mechanical thing. So now I'm saying, find a complete set of commuting operators for the algebra. And here, on the other patch, it's got its algebra, and you might not find a set of commuting operators which matches the ones over here. But you don't care about it now, because you say, well, you're going to match the algebra, so that's all. I'm not going to match the, the manifolds, which I'll give you the complete set of commuting operators. But I'm saying, no, 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 it's the algebra which I can cross from us that together. So it's a picture, something like that. Okay, now, um, I'm never going to go into tell you there's a lot of things which come into this picture. How they all tie up together is not yet completely clear, but I think I should mention all sorts of different things which come in and are clearly relevant. First of all, let me mention the fact that, and this plays a role in a lot of things I've been saying up to this point anyway, the fact that if you take the light rays of space, you see in the crystal picture, you, you've already got the light ray space. That's um, just going back to my previous picture. You've certainly got the space of light rays, and that's the PN. The problem here is to try and extend it here. Now, if it's a conformally flat space here, then you can extend this as a complex manifold. If it's conformally curved, then it looks as though this extension is a non commutative space. Now, this is what's new in this, this approach, in the palatial just approach. And that's what this other picture is trying to do. But nevertheless, you still imagine that if you're looking at the Lorentzian space time, you still got light rays. So those light rays, in other words, this space here, are geometrically clear cut and they are there. Okay. Now, that light ray space is naturally a symplectic manifold. Let me qualify that a little bit. If you have a light ray space, which would have been PN, then to make it a symplectic manifold, you need the momentum scaling of the light rays. So each light ray isn't just a tra trajectory of the photon. That photon, I'm going to say photon, it just means the mass is possible. It's not an actual photon. Um, that photon has a frequency, and that frequency is a momentum attached to it. So you have a null vector, that was the p, or pi if you like, when you square it. That null, null vector gives the scale to the light ray. And given that scale, you have a symplectic manifold. And here you can find this thing without just as if you like, it's just a PDX is its own it's a natural symplectic structure that that space has. That's fine, that's there. Now, what else do we have? Well, <coughs> what you can do is what you can do is you can take that symplectic manifold, this light rays here, this is the space of this light rays, and you try and do geometric quantization. Once you've got a symplectic manifold, this procedure of geometric quantization is a natural thing to try and do. It's a sort of it's a bit sloppy, there's a lot of freedom in it in a certain way. Um, but nevertheless, it's a natural thing to do. Now, what is the key thing in geometric quantization? Well, the first step you do, that I'm talking about, is technically pre-quantization. 
But the first thing you do is to take a circle round the world. See, this is just a reflecting manifold. This is now going to be a curved space time. Lorentzian. Okay, it's below the other volume, but that's, that's a mild restriction. Because it's here, not, not a lower one, is it? This, this space here has light rays in it. The light rays are given a point. It can be momentum scale light rays. It can be point in this infected manifold. First step, construct a circle bundle of this space here. What's that circle bundle? Here it's given to you. This is a very specific thing to the number of dimensions we're working in. The symplectic manifold comes about you can have a certain three dimensional space and the constructed light ray space and that and so on. And do exactly the same thing in a bit of symplectic manifold. But you're not given the circle bundle. Here, the circle bundle is there. It's there because you can make a spinner pointing along the light ray, and that spinner is related to the momentum through pi pi r equals p. That's the formula we had before. The p is the moment in other words, the momentum attached to that photon is the pi spinner times the strongest function. But what you lose in multiplying the pi spinner by the strongest function is the space factor. That space factor is a little flag, remember that? And that little flag rotates round the light ray. This will work in other dimensions, it only works in this number of dimensions. But that gives you a circle bump, which is just sitting there. And then you say, for the pre modernization, you construct a connection in this over here, with values in the circle bump over here, and that connection has to have as its curvature the symplectic two-fold. And that's the thing I wrote about here. And lo and behold, in fact, we're a little bit of geometry and I'll go through it. You can see that that symplectic connection is geometrically defined in the whole thing. It's there, phenomenal, in this whole picture. The fact that it's phenomenal is in itself it's bad news. Well, no, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's canonical, but it's floppy. That is to say, you can do it in a sense in different ways. I don't know how the whole language works here, but you might say canonical when it's given to you. But it's, it's nevertheless, you, you can do it in ways where you patch together the three things and, and this connection is important. I think it's more when you extend away from the, from the, the light ray space and when you're trying to make the twisted space. You can do it right now, one or the other. But that's where your freedom comes in. And a lot of things I'm saying are vague because uh, I'm not absolutely sure of the direction we should go. One thing that happens, I'm sure is important is this notion of local twisted transport. Now, what's that? This has been hanging around for a long time, and we've known about it as an example of power current connection and all those things. It's a natural thing. In twisted theory, when you do have a curved space time, and this has been known about for a long time, suppose you have a conformal Lorentzian four dimensional manifold, such as our space time that we described here, and you want a connection on what we call local twisters. That is, the only way the power has the four. But they're only defined at a point. They agree with what we had before, except that they're local. That is to say, what we had before was the omega, if you remember this, was something like the moment, no light ray out there, and an origin here. The omega has to go where how far away the light ray is. It's kind of the moment of that light ray at this point. So it's a moment thing. Now, as you move along the light ray, that um, well, only your brain takes a long run, right there, uh, but it's defined only with respect to the origin. If you move the origin to the, to the light ray, then um, the omega will go to zero. So if the origin is on the light ray, omega will go to zero. But it has to know where the origin is in order to know what this thing is here. But the point of view is a bit different. We say you, at each point you have an omega and pi, and you have a way of Transporting around. So you can take a curve in your space time, move it up here and high around. And when you um, have uh, a light ray which is supposed to describe, sorry, it doesn't actually, let me say it again. If you have a light ray, then only it is zero all the way along the light ray. Whereas if you have a general only at high or a general light ray sitting somewhere else, I suppose we live in flat space. If we live in flat space, 
you would certainly have these only with some pies, the same as we had before, but they are only with some pies. Is that the stone of origin means the point of looking at? So if you take some random point, you say, okay, what, what is the twist? How does that twist their existence from? Well, it's only with a pie, but if the origin had happened at that point, then only would have been more. I hope that's reasonably clear. I don't know that I said it very well. But you need now to know what happens as you walk along a curve. And as you walk along a curve, we have this propagation equation. The derivative of t is the tangent vector of the curve, and it tells you what well, omega does to along the curve, this tells you what pi is does to along the curve. If it was flat space, this thing p would be zero. P is basically the Ritchie tensor of the slight change in its trace. It's an interesting, useful thing that you have in the form structure. So it's the Ritchie tensor of the 12-fold it doesn't It's half, minus half of which it has 10 minutes of measurement with a minus 12 of the trace taken out. And it's a good, nice conformity, conform on Now the thing is that this propagation then does depend on, on the curvature in space time. It is conform with that, this, this, this integral, that is the integral loop, small loop, say, not infinitesimal, but one which is contractible. As you go around that loop, you always get back to where you start. But if it's conform curvature there, you go around the loop and you get something else. However, there's a very interesting thing here, which I knew for a long time and never quite saw the point of it, which is that if your infinity twister, well, your infinity twister to be constant is a necessary and sufficient condition for the Einstein vacuum. So the Einstein vacuum equations are equivalent to the infinity twister defined as I gave you before. Well, I didn't I give it to you? Anyway, so the infinity twister in the flat space case, where you now uh, allow them to, to define it in your local twister space, and as you move around, that local twister space um, might rotate around because of the presence of conformal curvature, but the infinity twister is constant if and only if the Einstein vacuum equation is hold. Now this is something we've all been worried and wondered about for a long time, you see. The bar curvature is something which tells you something's integral. It tells you that your space-time is conformal time. Or this conformal space, say, if the bar curvature vanishes, so you can integrally give a metric to the whole thing which is conformally. Um, uh, I said that right. <laughs> it tells you conformally flat, which is an integral thing. Whereas the strength of the Ritchie tensor vanishes or the multiple of the curvature, it didn't seem to be an integral thing. It's not the same sort of thing. Bar curvature is telling you something integrates, whereas the Ritchie curvature doesn't. But look at here, it does, you see. It tells you that the infinity twister. It's integral over the whole space. So I know that, but I couldn't see what it was good for. What it's good for is what I just had to say now. That, that, uh, that, 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 Uh, it requires more understanding of what this twisted space looks like. 
Poi qui c'è anche il vero aspetto, questo è il vero aspetto, 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 il vero The twister that that represents has a the P has a face, so you have a circle sitting there, which is completely global to this thing. So the, the structure, if you want the twister, now this is a twister really which is not on the end. So if you're talking about a flat twister space, you're talking about the twister which is not on the space PN which represents sideways. We're looking at a, a non-null twister. And these non-null twisters um, are defined in the flat twister space by this picture. Now this picture, if you want that twister, also you know, its phase notice as an additional circle. Now um, the, the, the picture of the additional circle is the space that Ernesto was telling me is essentially the, the fundamental model for a non composite geometry. Now, I haven't learned about that before, but this seems to be incredibly suggestive. That this non-conscious geometry is sort of hiding in this picture together with the extra phase that you automatically have because it's twisted here. The twisted theory is just sitting there waiting to have this non-conscious structure that the minister is telling me uh, how to how to how to okay. okay, but that's all I want to say, I think, about the things. I just want to say one more thing, which is more speculative than what I'm saying. I've been saying this speculative thing, but I've come to think of it. It really should work, particularly this thing at the time between this very natural thing coming out of twisted theory and the non quantum geometries that, that, that are already known. The other thing I did like to say is the final something, is I want to be a little bit crazy too. Um, you see, we here have had a conversation between Z and Z bars. Very early in twisted theory, I did wonder about whether the Z should have a commutation rule or the Z bars as well. And I went home and then still was a bit, and I realized at that time people didn't know it was a cosmological constant, so my eyes were degenerate. And I took it around and I saw you get, get rid of it and then it was back to the commutation. It didn't do anything to back to here. However, if you have an eye which has a cosmological constant, non degenerate, I don't think that works. So I think you now have these two, well, the third, third one, two, well, three commutation rules all intertwined with each other. Now, if you only didn't have these ones, it would certainly not be anything about quantum gravity. It would not be quantum gravity. Why would it not be quantum gravity? Because quantum gravity requires the planet length to be fundamental. This is what defines the scale of gravitational quantum effects and so on. The black length is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which is ridiculously tiny. It's 10 to the 20 smaller than any ordinary result respecting particle. So you're looking at ridiculously tiny scales and people are there with a little bit. But it has importance in various things in where quantum mechanics and space-time curvature are becoming related. If you don't have any room for that black length, you can't have a quantum gravity theory. So what I was telling you up to this point, if it's anything in physics, it's classical general relativity. You're describing classical space times. You're not talking about quantum space times. If you wanted to go further than that and talk about quantum gravity, you could put that information in here. This is some new constant, or the constant will be related to related to lambda and all sorts of things, which could encode the Planck scale. And it would have to encode a huge number as well. Because the Planck scale is very, very tiny things, the cosmological <laughs> constants do very, very large things. There is an enormous number going from one scale to the other. So, hiding in physics, there is this normal number, this enormous number that's been known for a long time. It's a big mystery. Why gravitation should be so weak in comparison with other forces? There is a huge number. So there has to be a huge number of hiding in this. I think there is, it needs to be shifting a little carefully with the dimensions of things. 
um, the epsilon and the, the lambda is a related standard way. I'll just leave you with a speculation at the moment. Thank you very much. Yes, well, I guess, as I was saying, I mean, the, the motivation here 
is the first look at the classical space time. Now, as far as I can see, you're only going to get something common with the additional computation rules for that thing. If you just stick to the Greg and Zephyr computation rules, there's no room for Planck's constant. I mean, there's no room for the Planck uh, length. Planck's constant is one, you see. So when you say something small, small perturbation or something, uh -huh. So if they are quantized according to these rules. They're different. They are quantized according to this uh, twist of rules. Well, yes, I'm not sure what quantized means here, because, because it's quantized already here, yeah, yeah. the, the twisters are already quantized, even though the space-time isn't. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But to make that space-time pick up some quantum features, I think you need the other computation rule. Which so I there are two equivalent descriptions of transcript space-time. Yeah, but it's ordinary. Ordinary metric. I just mentioned the equivalent, but I mean, I'm saying what I hope, not what I know. See, I don't know the full picture. I can see that there is something hiding here which is a bit to me. That is, that you can carry through very similar things to what we did in the non linear graviton, which was a complex uh, anti cell dual spaces. But now it's you're, you're forcing it, um, I, I like to keep the right light ray space because this, one of the reasons is it's very difficult to know what you mean by local. So if you try to do a patching which is local in some sense, and you've just got the algebras, I get terribly confused by what to do. But if you've got the light ray space and you're not too far away from it, then you do have a notion of locality. And so you can say what well, I mean by little patch, what I mean by patching little patches together. But there isn't any quantum geometry in this. You could might imagine doing quantum mechanics in the background, which is a classical space time. If that quantum mechanics is to tie in with the geometry, which of course we want, we're going to be making any advances in, in understanding how uh, gravity interrelates with quantum mechanics, we've certainly got to have that. This is, is a preliminary program of simply trying to express classical space times in this framework. You have to proceed beyond that, and sure, to do interesting physics, we're going to have to proceed beyond that. This is probably not going to do any interesting physics at this level. Well, thank you. Maybe you are going to be victim of some other questions on the coffee. On the coffee. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, the, the main role is being played by Follow Morphy here, right? And, and that's uh, the main point. Now, when you consider that you go to non-commutative algebras, uh, the, the class of, of holomorphic functions becomes extremely restricted, say for example in quaternions or in, or in Clifford algebras. And it doesn't mean that. So if it became that restricted, now it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work, yes. yes. So what I mean is that you have a notion, an appropriate notion, of a holomorphic non commutative geometry. Now, uh, I'm not sure that most of them know what that means, but I, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> a holomorphic non commutative geometry. And that's got the kind of flexibility on the one hand and rigidity on the other. There's something magical about ordinary complex analysis where you, where you have, and I, I would be amazed by it, you have some kind of great flexibility, but when you've got enough globality in some way, it suddenly becomes very rigid. And this kind of feature to the system, I feel, is, is very attractive from the point of view of trying to describe physics. Now, I want to retain that kind of feature. So you want to have something which has as much local freedom, in a sense, the problem of the functions now. But yet, when you have enough globality, suddenly it gets you very rigid, with the, maybe a fine natural freedom or something like that. And that's the kind of picture I would hope that we can obtain in this kind of description. Thank you. Yes. Um, the, the current style of resource theory with respect to the applications in you know, other areas of physics, for example, and other strength theories. Yes. Well, it's just, I mean, I, my talk was not concerned with that. Yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, you're okay. With regard to how much 
activity with implicit there is very much in such areas. You see, in, in uh, it was in the early 2000s, um, a written uh, paper in which he showed how ideas of twisted theory could be combined with those of string theory, and this sort of launched a new way of looking at high energy theories. Um, I should make the point there that it's always been pretty clear to me that twisted theory would have important applications in physics for massless particles. When they've got mass, there's a whole area of uh, understanding which I haven't talked about. I've talked about the, the Ludwig problem, which is to do with uh, self dual and anti self dual parts, which is still talking about massless things, massless interactions. I didn't actually much about interactions, but the interactions are also contained in, in these pictures. That we're talking about. So you do have that, but you're really talking about massless things. Now, in these, these new developments, people get away with it because they're thinking of very, very high energy. So you're thinking of maybe what the blue one background is in the uh, sort of LHC or something like that. And then having these calculations are very important because if you want to see effects which are new physics, you have to know what the old physics gives you. And what the old physics gives you are lots and lots of complicated calculations. And these calculations are intended to be done with final diagrams. Away. And then you have a more important computer calculation, you see. Whereas with these new techniques, starting with what Whitman and what some other people have been able to do, so you can see these formulas, but obviously they actually are very simple formulae, and you can obtain them by much simpler computing methods. Now, bringing this string idea into twisted ideas together with twisted ideas is a powerful way of doing this. It's continued in this kind of Directions which don't necessarily involve string theory. They tend to involve symmetry, but they shouldn't necessarily be symmetry. Uh, I can't talk about it much in detail because I've never sort of buried myself in it. Um, one, let me mention one thing which is very satisfying to me. One of my uh, early graduate students is Andy Hodges. Well known today because of the Alan Turing book, which Still on Twitter's face, that's not I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, the, the, the book was, was uh, gave a lot of insights into in the children's life and so on, which he wrote before he did his PhD work, he then came to work as a graduate student. Now, as a graduate student, I mean, sorry, as a postgraduate student, as a postgraduate, postdoc, he uh, developed the idea of Twister on the field. And looking at diagrams and developing twisted diagrams from time diagrams without very much interest in the physics community. But then the women made the paper, and suddenly they're all interested in this, and all this work has become very important in that area. Yeah, so this I feel really gratified by this after all the work we've done almost single handed. Um, but it's, it's obviously important, this stuff, and it's clearly made big headway. And in particular, in te technical achievements, what you can actually do is much simpler procedures than going through these horrendous multiple final diagram approaches. So that's nice to see. It doesn't, as far as I can see, address any of the questions I was talking about today. I mean, you can do things like, uh, say, say you're trying to do that. You see, you could do the non-familiar graviton construction and the play here, yeah. or the left-handed graviton. And then you could turn away from left-handed by putting in perturbations. Which is fine. You know, that's what you do. But again, it's per perturbative at some stage. So all these te techniques are fundamentally perturbative. And if you want to see where the non-linear features do use in geometry, as I do, uh, it's hard to see where it's going. I mean, it's important to do, certainly if you want to capture it, but I'm not sure how much insight to give you into some geometric questions. So I hope we can get further so Okay, we have to stop here the question session. Let's thank Professor Fernandez again.
de Sotroches, no sin antes eh, agradecer a Miguel Chicotenca, a su apoyo financiero, a Hugo Campeán, por su apoyo financiero también, al director del proyecto Abacus, Isidro Hitler, por ayudar con las finanzas, al Instituto Politécnico Nacional y a Francisco Torobiates, que, eh, que también este, aportaron cantidades importantes, así como a la dirección del Senestado, José Mustre, Ricardo Pérez, entre todos, si no chinito, ¿verdad? Y, y se pagó el evento. <risa> y este, entonces, bueno, quisiera que, que agradecemos a todos ellos este, su generoso apoyo de la ciudad. Y ahora, muy ordenadamente, con la firma del libro, vamos a caminar nosotros lentamente hacia el café. Y allá se ve que ya estoy en Gila, en Gila de Mar, en una vida muy cerrada para la firma de los libros. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. 